Okay, I think we're ready to start here. So welcome everyone. Friday noon talk. Uh, last Friday noon talk of the year. So thank you for coming. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Mikhail Samard to speak. Uh, Mikhail did his MSc here in the program, MPU. He then did a PhD at the University of Montreal following that. And recently you're now a postdoc at the uh, UCL in London, England. And I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you, Pete. Um, so hi everyone, it's, uh, it's nice to, to see some new MPU students in person. Uh, so today, basically, uh, as Pete said, uh, I'm a postdoc. I've just done one year in the University College London. And what I wanted to, to, to talk to you about is basically the projects that we have going on uh, at UCL. And it's, it's quite, I think it's nice because it's probably very different from what you're doing here because we have, for example, a proton center and everything. So uh, this is kind of just exposing everyone to new ideas, new research and everything. Yeah, okay. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, as you see from the, the, type, the, the name of my talk, it says from proton imaging for lung cancer to AI and digital pathology. And if you wonder basically what's the link between those two things, there is absolutely no link. It's going to be kind of two separated talks. So I'm going to spend about 25 minutes on each of them. All right, so we're going to start with uh, proton imaging. And uh, proton imaging, before talking about proton imaging, we have to talk about proton therapy. So I'm just going to do some kind of wrap up of, of, of this topic. So as you probably remember from your radiation physics class, uh, when you want to use protons for radiotherapy, uh, what's nice about them is that the dose deposition patterns that you have uh, with proton beams, they can be made more conformal to the tumor than conventional X-rays. And this is due to the presence of the Bragg peak that you have. So what you see on the right in the figure. And uh, the depth of the, the Bragg peak that you have, so this is a really highly localized uh, spot in your patient where you're going to have a lot of dose. Uh, it depends, it's defined as the range of the beam roughly. And this is uh, going to depend on the energy of the protons and basically the tissues that you're going to cross through your patient. Um, so with this very highly localized uh, dose deposition, uh, proton therapy really comes with the promise of sparing LT tissues and re reducing radiation-related toxicities. So uh, the idea is that this is going to really help improving survival outcomes for certain types of cancer. Uh, for example, uh, there's there's been uh, some clinical studies that have shown that for lung cancer, uh, dose escalation, so just giving more dose to the tumor, is the way to go to improve uh, survival outcomes. But this cannot be done at the moment with uh, photon radiotherapy because you're going to give too much dose to too much uh, secondary dose to the heart. So uh, that's one of the examples where proton therapy could be really helpful. Um, and really this promise of superior dose distribution has really driven the development of proton therapy. There is now more than 120 proton centers in the world, many more in, in development. And this is just gonna keep increasing in the next year. Uh, also, for example, in the UK at the moment, there's two uh, proton therapy centers. There is one in Manchester since I think 2018. And there's a brand new one now at UCLH, which is UCL's affiliated hospital. So the, the picture on the left that you see is one of the four gantries that they have. Yeah, so uh, this looks good in, in theory, but in practice, it's a bit difficult to do proton therapy. Uh, basically what happens is that this improved dose distribution comes at the cost of lower robustness to uncertainties. Uh, what can happen is that the highly localized Bragg peak uh, can shift to really undesirable depths inside the patient if you incorrectly estimate the range of the beam. So I'm going to come back to that a bit later. But the result of this is that you can have overdose age uh, of organs at risk or really underdose age of the tumor. Uh, and this is really going to limit the benefits of proton therapy. Uh, so for example, if you, if you look at this, this example that you have in the middle, uh, what happens is that if you uh, incorrectly estimate the range and the beam falls back to a bit uh, before in the patient, uh, you're going to underdose the tumor. And in the other way, if the beam goes too far, you're going to put most of the dose in the organ at risk, which would be the brainstem here. So it's really, you have to be really careful with proton beams. And if you think about the reasons why your, your a beam range could be incorrectly estimated, uh, there's a bunch of, of, uh, of things that you can think of. For example, there's what we can put into interfraction changes. So for example, the patient loses weight during the course of treatment. And of course, the anatomy is not going to be the same at the time of treatment as it was during planning at first. 
You also have intrafraction changes. So for example, just patient breathing, if you're treating lung tumors or just any kind of motion, uh, you can also have patient positioning errors and you can probably think of a few reasons why uh, you could have some errors in your beam range estimation. So the message of, of this slide is really that to help proton therapy reach its potential, what you need to do is what we call adaptive proton therapy. And the idea uh, of adaptive proton therapy is in, it's basically just adapting the treatment to the geometry at the time of treatment. So this can be done really at multiple uh, time scales. So for example, through uh, real-time tracking, uh, if you wanted to do for intrafraction changes, or by just replanning uh, your dose uh, if the anatomy has changed too much on the day of treatment. And so that's that's kind of the, the context around why we want to do proton imaging, basically. Uh, so in our lab, we're specifically uh, developing a, a proton imaging system to, to try to develop adaptive proton therapy. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce the general idea of proton imaging and then talk to, to you a bit more about this device. So here, let's start with this, this scenario that you, you're just irradiating with a 200 MeV proton beam inside of an object. Uh, so there's various types of detectors that can be used to measure uh, what we call the range of the proton beam, so here, R0. And uh, what happens is that if you were to add some kind of object or a patient uh, between this beam and the detector, what's going to happen is that your, the beam gets pulled back to a shorter range R here. And the reason why that happens is that basically the, the proton beam is pressing the patient, it's losing energy, so its range is going to be reduced. And you can essentially show that this measured range shift, if you have the adequate detector, can be related to what we call the water equivalent thickness or the wet of the patient uh, along the beam spot. Okay, so the, there is kind of, this is kind of a simple setup to estimate the, the, the amount of material you've traversed in your patient. And the wet is defined as the maybe you've seen this in classes or whatever, but it's defined as the line integral of the proton relative stopping power along the beam's path. So basically the wet is really giving you an idea of what the proton beam is gonna see in its way. So that's why it's kind of really in, intimately related to proton therapy. You know? um, and finally, if you want to do imaging from, from this idea, what you're gonna do is use a pencil beam scanning setup. So you know, instead of just shooting one beam as you see in the image, you're gonna shoot a bunch of beams in different X, Y positions all subsequently. And then you're gonna be able, for example, to get an estimate of the wet at each point that the beam goes into the patient. And then you can roughly reconstruct a coarse wet map of that patient. So this is, this is really equivalent to taking a radiograph of your patient with protons from the beam's eye view. So you can see that it's nice because it's perfectly, it could be perfectly registered, the imaging and the treatment. So that, that solves a lot of issues in terms of adaptive radiotherapy. Um, so yeah, the message is really as proton imaging can provide the wet, it really directly informs of any relevant change in the proton beam spot and could be really helpful for adaptive proton therapy. So, okay, so now I'm gonna talk more about the device that we're working on and basically, just before talking about adaptive radiotherapy and everything, the idea that we had was to develop a, a proton imaging device specifically for uh, tracking for lung cancer. Um, and the idea really of this project was to design an easily integrable in the clinic, uh, fast and really low cost uh, proton radiography system that uh, we can use to provide image guidance for uh, cancers that might benefit from escalated dose and proton therapy. So as I said, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So the way that this would work essentially is that if you see in the image, you would alternate between treatment and imaging mode. So that's basically just changing the energy of your source. So you're giving those inside the patient and then inside the detector. And then based on the images that you get, you can develop some kind of feedback loop to guide into the treatment and do some treatment adaptation. For example, this could be done through gating or uh, a bunch of different things. Yeah, so talking about the device, I'm gonna introduce it. It's not super complicated. Um, let's just consider a, this pencil beam scanning system. And what you put at the end of it after your patient is a volumetric scintillator. So for example, just a big, block of plastic that has scintillation properties. Um, the volumetric scintillator's role is to convert the radiation from the protons to optical light. And then you're gonna use, for example, CCD cameras to capture uh, this dose distribution. Um, yeah, and as I, I wrote down there, basically this 
kind of simple setup is going to require to be exact a 3D quenched light emission distribution, which is roughly representative of the 3D dose distribution of the pencil beam that you're going to shoot inside the, the scintillator. Um, and what's, what's cool with that is that you can acquire 2D projections of this 3D dose distribution with CCD cameras placed at different angles around the scintillator. So, uh, the most common way to, to basically uh, acquire images from that is to put a CCD camera in what we call the distal end of the volumetric scintillator. So basically you just put a camera at the end and the image that you're gonna get is just all of the light integrated along the beam spot. So that's why you see, for example, on the bottom right, this is those are Monte Carlo images, but this is what you would get. So basically you just have your, your pencil beam that scatters through the patient and you see this kind of blob. So, it's cool, but it's not exactly quantitative because you, it's an integrated signal. So we really require extensive calibration to be uh, quantitative and to infer the wet. Uh, also, uh, as you can see, largely suffers from multiple Coulomb scattering. So protons, they, they really scatter a lot inside the, of human tissues. So it, it has a tendency to be very blurry and lead to very blurred images when you do reconstruction. So this is not exactly the way to go. The way to go is using what we call lateral views. So here, those are our real images that we took experimentally. And, um, and basically you end up with 2D views of the Bragg curve inside of the, of the detector. So you can have a top view or the lateral view. And in our setup, we're gonna use those, those two views. And what's nice about it is that the lateral views, they really provide quantitative information because you can see that it's quite easy in those images to infer the range of the proton beam, you know? Um, and also you can take those two views and combine them and basically pinpoint in 3D the, the information where the most of the energy was deposited. So it, it does the, a double job of just giving you a, a quantitative measurement of the wet and also it's telling you exactly where this was in space. So. It, this is really information that we can use for um, imaging. Right, so uh, enough about just um, physics like that. I'm just gonna show you the device that we built. So uh, on the top left, you see kind of the design of the detector. So you have the scintillator in blue, you have two cameras that are mounted in a rack here, and there's a mirror to capture the two lateral views. And on the top right, you see um, basically the first prototype that we built without its outer casing. And you can see that it looks a bit bulky, but it, it's just because we used um, lenses and CCD cameras with a pretty large focal length. So this is kind of just limited by the focal length. So there's a, a few options to make this setup more compact. On the bottom left, you see that uh, this is just the, the detector itself with its outer casing. And the goal is just that because it's a scintillator, you want to limit any kind of parasitic light into it. And on the bottom right, uh, it's, a, it's a video that's gonna show some, as you're scanning through your, your object there, you see that it acquires different pencil beams at different positions, and you see the beam getting pulled back when, for example, there's more material in the way, and this is how you're gonna reconstruct your images. So this is, this is, a, this is real experimental data that we got at UCLH with this detector. So it's quite cool to see that just, you have enough light to measure something with the CCD camera and everything. But of course it takes a lot of calibration and just adjusting the gains of the camera to get nice signal. Um, one thing that we realized too, is that when you do uh, stuff with uh, optical photons, instead of just radiation, you, you need to do a lot of corrections. So for example, we need to do optical vignetting. We need to do a correction for the lenses. We also need to do a perspective correction because your, your CCD camera is kind of, it, the field of view gets larger as you go deeper. So the kind of the volume of the scintillator becomes smaller in the image. So you have to kind of correct for those things. There's also refraction uh, and there is a thing called scintillation, uh, scintillator quenching that you need to take into account to be really quantitative. So there was a bunch of corrections that we had to do. And finally, there's a thing called a triggering system that we needed to develop to synchronize the beam delivery with camera acquisition. So basically it's just making sure that whenever the beam is being shot from the, the source, you're gonna acquire an image with your uh, CCD cameras at this exact time. So this is a lot of hardware things that we had to, to work through. And what I like about the, this device is that it's quite simple. Uh, on the left, you see a device that is for single event proton imaging, which is kind of the gold standard way of doing proton imaging. And you can see that it's really bulky and everything. And it's a, 
Uh, it's really nice. It can do tomography. For us, we only do radiography, but it's also, you can see that it, it's really bulky. And unfortunately, it's not compatible with clinical uh, beams right now. So we, we took the option on the right of doing integrated mold imaging, where basically your, your detector is a plastic cube. So that's kind of simpler than the, the setup that you have on the right and the left. Okay, so now that we have a working detector with a bunch of corrections, here I'm showing just some early uh, raw results from, from the images. Um, if you remember a bit, the PDD of protons, they look like that with the bright curve. So this is kind of what we measured with this detector at different energies. And we tried to evaluate if, if you could get a good estimate of the range. So on average, we found out that we can be a submillimetric in terms of precision on the range, which is not, exactly the, the, the equivalent of the gold standard for proton imaging. This is much, uh, in proton imaging, people typically reach 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeter, but this is good for a, a plastic cube, you know? So, and also there's a bunch of improvements that you can still work on with this setup. Uh, the second thing that we did was the positional accuracy. So basically what you see here, the blue dots, uh, we're just delivering a, a plan that's 50 by 50, pencil beams over a field of view of 15 by 15 cm, and each beam is spaced by three millimeter. So basically the idea was to, to say, let's deliver this plan and see if we can infer the position correctly. So when we did it at first with the, the raw data, we found out that we got this kind of result, this kind of overlay, which is pretty bad, but this is actually what made us understand that, okay, well, you need to correct for refraction, you need to correct for a bunch of optical things. So once you do all the corrections, you end up with this thing, which is much better in terms of uh, quantitative accuracy, but there's also slight issues left with, especially with the pixel size that it's not perfectly estimated. But what's nice is that we, we understood that with two lateral views, we can really infer the beam position without needing to rely on the TPS itself or the log files. And if this were to, to work, really well at some point, we could even use it as a QA device, you know. Right, so this is this is a slide I'm not really gonna go deep into, but this is just to show that, okay, up to now we've been able to see that our device can give good quantitative accuracy, we can do a lot of things with it, so it's ready to, so we're ready to do imaging. But if we want to do that, we need to have a nice image reconstruction framework. And basically having a, a reconstruction framework with this set of, 2D lateral views like that, which are from optical CCD camera images, was kind of non-existent in the literature. So we spent basically the last year working on something here to do image reconstruction using those two sets of lateral views. So I'm not really gonna get into this. It's, it, it's a bunch of proton physics and everything, but this is just to show you that we've done a lot of work in terms of image reconstruction and we can discuss it if anyone is interested. Right, so now that we have a working device that seems to work well and a nice image reconstruction framework. We can validate it with Monte Carlo simulations. And this is what we did at first. So those basically we did GR4 Monte Carlo simulations that simulated the quench light emission in a 30 by 30 cm squared volumetric scintillator. So this is reproducing as closely as we can get to uh, real life conditions. And the uh, phantoms that we used, we use an extended cardiac torso phantom, so an XCAT1 that you see on the top right, and also a slanted edge, which is basically a way to estimate the resolution of your system. Uh, the beam parameters were just selected to be as close as the parameters that we have in, with the clinical beam. And what we did is one huge phase space of many hundreds of gigabytes of data that were sampled at every millimeter. So this way you can kind of subsample different beam spacing. So you can evaluate the, the impact of beam spacing and reconstruction. So here are the first results I wanted to show. Um, basically what you see on top is a reconstructed wet. Uh, in the bottom, it's the absolute difference with respect to the ground truth. And then you see the mean absolute error. And from left to right, you have different reconstruction methods. So the first one that you see, the 2D distal view, is basically using the distal view of the camera that I showed at first. And I said, it gives blurry images because it suffers a lot from multiple Coulomb scattering. And this is kind of a, an example of poor image quality that you get with those images. So then we moved on to lateral views uh, where you see the Bragg peak. And we basically, with the 1D lateral view, we implemented a, a literature method that, that was kind of well known to do images. So you can see an improvement upon the distal view. 
but still it was not using exactly the, the entire set of information that we had with the two the, the sets of two lateral views. So we, we upgraded to this. So the, the third column that you see is um, the algorithm that we developed and you can see some improvements on that. And then at the end, you see what we have, uh, what's called single event imaging, which is the gold standard, which is the, the system that you have with the much bigger setup that we had at first. And it's just to show that we're, we're not exactly close, but not too far. Uh, of course, it's impossible to reach this level of image quality, but uh, still we need to kind of think about, okay, you need to have some constraints due to, because you want to do adaptive proton therapy. So it's still pretty good. Right. Uh, the second thing that we looked at is what, um, basically answering the question, how does the, the pencil beam spacing affect image quality? So it's really an interesting question because it's a trade-off of, of dose and imaging time against image quality. Because the, the, the more beams you use, of course, you're going to get better image quality because you're better sampling your image, but you're going to take a lot of time to deliver them and it's going to give more dose to the patient. So it's kind of a, an interesting trade-off to see. And so this is just showing two to five millimeter spacing. Uh, now, if we look at the images of the XCAT Phantom from two to six millimeter beam spacing, you can, can quite appreciate that as, as you increase in, in, uh, in spacing, you, the images get a bit coarser, they're a bit harder to, to see the, the edges and everything, but it's still not bad. So even if you look, for example, at the tumor inside of the, the lung, you can probably still make it out its contours and maybe even track it. So. Kind of an it's going to be an interesting thing to see in the future if we can use those six millimeter spacing to do tracking. And just to be a bit more realistic, if we think in terms of imaging time, uh, so if we assume a realistic three millisecond per pencil beam to deliver, which is well within what current accelerators can do, um, you see, for example, if you take the five millimeter one, there is a possibility of creating very large field of view images of thirty by thirty in about 10 seconds with acceptable image quality. So that's that's quite nice. And you can also, for example, if you focus on the, the, red square, the red square here, you can reduce the field of view to 10 by 10 centimeters squared with the six millimeter spa spacing and reduce imaging time to less than a second. So then you can start thinking that, okay, this might be an option for, for real time, almost real time tracking. If you were able to find a tumor and then just image the smaller field of view and follow it. Okay, so that's it for the XCAT Phantom. Now uh, moving on to the, um, the slanted edge to see the resolution. Basically, this is again showing wet images for the four different reconstruction methods. And the conclusions are essentially the same, it just keeps getting better. And um, you can see that the, the resolution values uh, on the bottom left, they're, they're really far away from the, the single event imaging, but that's, that's expected. And uh, yeah, this was basically just a demonstration that the, the reconstruction framework that we developed is as quite a, a not a, a limited, but an important impact in terms of maximizing the image quality that we can get. Okay, so now that we have a Monte Carlo validation, we can move on to experimental stuff. So uh, we tried to do experiments at UCLH, but of course we had issues because it's experimental work. And uh, essentially we had issues with the triggering system, uh, which really delayed our radiographic data acquisition. Um, fortunately for us, we, we had been working with people in the Mayo Clinic in Arizona and MD Anderson Cancer Center, who have been developing uh, a similar, simpler system for in vivo dosimetry and also range verification. So, uh, what we did, what I did is to go on a three week visit at Mayo Clinic in Arizona to gather some data, to kind of simulate the system that we had at UCLH. So yeah, I left dark and not sunny London for really sunny Arizona, but thing is that it was in, uh, in August, so it was uh, not exactly the weather you would want to be in. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna show you the, um, the setup that we had. Uh, in, in Mayo Clinic in Arizona, you can see in the middle, there's the, the smaller detector that they use. The, the smaller part really in the center of the image is the scintillator. It's much smaller than the one we have. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 cube, which, which is limited. So we can do like big objects and everything. And also it has only a single slow camera. Uh, so we can do like real time images or whatever, but it really works on a similar principle. So it's really just a scintillator. You shoot into it and you gather projections with a CCD camera. And basically 
since we have one camera, we needed to use some kind of trick to acquire the two views. So what we're doing is that we have a second uh, couch that is serving as a phantom holder, as you can see in, in blue on top, uh, and it's mounted on this water tank. It's not exactly the, the, the most beautiful setup, but it worked out. So what you're going to do is that you're going to image with the first lateral view like that, and then you're going to rotate the couch by 90 degrees, and then you can get the second lateral view. So this is kind of just uh, here showing the two different views. So this, this ends up quite nicely simulating the design that we have in, uh, at UCLH. Uh, in terms of phantoms and imaging parameters, uh, we scanned a bunch of things. I'm only going to present uh, a subset of those. So we've had a slanted edge phantom, again, to look at the resolution. Uh, we also wanted to see, does this have good uh, water equivalent thickness accuracy? So we scanned uh, tissue equivalent inserts that we know their properties to see that. Uh, we also did an MVQA phantom because it's an interesting phantom with a lot of small features, and it's also good for resolution. Uh, we did uh, what's called a Las Vegas phantom, which is basically a, an aluminum slab that you have holes of different depth and size uh, drilled into it. So it's ready to see uh, object detectability in it. And at the end, we did pediatric heads and thorax. Uh, but this was, this was done on the last day. So it was not, a, not as successful as I would have wanted it to be. Uh, we, of course, we needed to use smaller energies because it's only a 10 cm deep cube. So you cannot use uh, uh, large energies because your beam is going to go, uh, is not going to deposit its energy inside of this integrator. Uh, we also did a bunch of beam spacings again to evaluate the image quality as a function of beam spacing. So I'm going to show you here the results for the Las Vegas Phantom. So from left to right, you have uh, different beam spacings. And from uh, top to bottom, you have uh, two different reconstruction methods. So the, the one on top is uh, the one from the literature that I presented a bit earlier. And the one on the bottom is what we developed recently. So what's interesting to see here is that the Las Vegas Phantom contains really small objects to resolve because it's a quite a small phantom. And you can really see the impact of, uh, of the pencil beam spacing. You can see the small objects that get really distorted um, with larger spacing just because of the of sampling issues. Uh, you can also appreciate in general that the, the 2D method that we developed is, is less blurry than the top one, especially in the, the two millimeter images. Uh, also, I put the, the time used to, to scan this just to give you an idea of the time that it's going to take to get those kind of images. All right, so uh, also here, I'm not going to get into this slide, but basically we, we did some quantitative analysis of this and found out that you can improve contrast by about 27% um, with the reconstruction method that we proposed. In terms of quantitative accuracy, we were able to, on average, get a, an absolute uh, mean error of 0.4 millimeter, which is a bit better than what we had for the range with our system, but it's probably because this this setup has been more extensively calibrated. So 0.4 millimeter is is really good. It's on par with uh, almost on par with uh, the the best systems that you have in proton imaging. So that's really satisfying. Um, we did the MVQA Phantom. As you can see, it's um, it's not the best image quality, but this is because I think I I ended up hitting the table or something between the two acquisitions and. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, we had some issues in terms of, of misalignment. And also what's interesting, if you look at the image on the top right, you can see that um, the bright peaks that you get are really, the images that you get are really difficult to analyze because you start with one bright, uh, you start with one pencil beam, which has a certain finite width, and you go through objects that are really close, closely, uh, latent in space, and they have very different water equivalent thicknesses. So you end up having your black peak being like tripled because you're crossing very different geometries. So those those kind of images were a bit trickier to, to interpret. So that's why the image quality is not excellent. So this is the, the pediatric head phantom, which is it kind of looks really bad on the on the screen, but believe me, it's not that bad. Uh, it's it's blurrier than the other images because it's much thicker. So there is a lot more scattering inside the, the, the object. So, so that's just a limitation of proton imaging. The resolution really depends on the, the, the amount of tissue you're going to go through. But still, it's, a, it's an interesting first step for proton imaging like that to get still images with features that you can recognize and you can really see the, the impact here of beam spacing. Um, 
yeah, so I'm going to conclude on this uh, and move on to the next topic after. So, so really about proton imaging, uh, from what we, we've done right now, we, I think we can suggest that we can acquire proton radiographs rapidly in less than a second with a system that is uh, mostly low cost and really easily integrable in the clinic. So you could, you could imagine just packaging this thing on a, on a small couch and just sliding it under the, the table. So it could be a, a very simple way of doing proton radiographs. Uh, there's clear benefits of using our reconstruction framework and also uh, next steps are going to be basically to work a bit more on uh, image reconstruction. So we're exploring at the moment the convolution techniques to improve image quality and also we're going to work on the clinical applications that I, I talked about at first. All right, so I'm going to move on to a completely different topic and it's basically it's artificial intelligence for digital pathology. So um, this really, really has nothing to do with proton imaging. It's just that when we, when I started working at UC at UCL, um, we had a nice opportunity with pathologists to who had the luxury of having way too much data on their end and basically nobody to work on them. And the, it was kind of a good opportunity to start doing AI because you know uh, that's that's what that's what we want, right? You sometimes you want to start doing AI and you don't have data, but then. When people come to see you and they say, I have too much data, then it's kind of your duty in medical physics to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing AI for the sake of this. So here what I'm going to present is predicting soft-tissue tumor diagnosis with deep learning. And uh, yeah, as you see, we're going to focus really on soft-tissue tumors, or as I'm going to call them in the talk, it's the, the correct term is mesenchymal tumors. And when they're mal malignant, we call them sarcomas. So you might be more familiar with the term sarcomas. It's just that when they're benign, we call them just soft tissue tumors. Right, so since we're in radiation therapy, uh, we typically don't talk about the pathology side of thing because that happens, um, I guess, before. <laughs> um, so from what I understand, at least for sarcomas, what's gonna happen is that before treatment, we typically have a biopsy or a resection of some tissue that we need to identify the tumor subtype. So this is really the pathologist's job. So their workflow to, to propose a diagnosis is, is kind of shown here. So first, they're going to receive their sample. They're going to put it under a microscope. They're going to uh, use their experience to identify a few potential diagnoses. So here I put four, but it could be 10 of them or something. And then what they're going to do is order some diagnostic tests. So it's, it's mostly biochemical tests that they do, and they get a positive, negative, or whatever. And based on the results of that, they can propose a diagnosis. <laughs> uh, so this job here must be uh, ba basically what I wrote in the bottom here. Providing an accurate diagnosis in a timely manner is really critical for patient care because it's going to guide treatment and inform on the prognosis. So you can see that it's, it's really a task that must be done quickly and accurately. And one of the issues that we have with it is that here I'm showing, for example, 10 different sarcoma subtypes. So those are different diagnoses. And maybe it's hard to understand for us, but pathologists tell us that there are so many morphological similarities between them. And it's really, it's really a tough job to do to differentiate them just based on the images. They need a lot of clinical context and they need a lot of help with the, um, the diagnostic test to make a diagnosis. So we have this issue that this workflow is really a, a challenging task. And also because of that, it's going to be a very lengthy and costly procedure. So the consequences are that sometimes the treatments are delayed for sarcomas. It's a necessary cost because you have to do so many diagnostic tests. And also sometimes they're just going to run out of biopsy tissue. So you need to gather a second biopsy to do more tests. So, so the idea was basically to say, well, let's use an AI solution to aid the pathologist for decision making and make things simpler. So really the kind of the overreaching goal of, of our involvement is this, is to demonstrate that an AI model can help pathologists reach the correct diagnosis faster with less tests. And the impact, of course, is going to be shorter turnaround times, uh, less cost, and a reduction in the number of repeated biopsies. So I hope you can see that it's a it's kind of a very practical problem. It's, it's never going to replace a pathologist doing AI like that. It's really, the goal is really to help them do their job faster. So I think that's why when we present to pathologists, it, it's, it's always received positively because it's just a tool to make your job more efficient. Right, so let's focus on, on this, this AI model here that we're developing. Um, 
So here I'm just showing the four steps in terms of inference. So let's say once you, you've trained your network and everything, this is kind of the way this would work in a clinical workflow. So when, when you're gonna get a new slide to, to analyze, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna digitize it uh, using uh, one of those scanners, as you see here, to produce a whole slide image. So basically it's just a digitized version of your, of your slide. Uh, you're going to send this image to a trained deep learning network, and then you're going to get some output that you're going to show to the pathologist, and they're going to make some decisions based on that. So the output, as you, as you might see here, it, it can come in many forms. This is always kind of open for discussion. But what what I what we're suggesting now is that it's going to report where in the image you think you have some some tumor tissue, and also. It's going to be color co coded to show the, the diagnosis it thinks there is. Uh, and then you can report on top basically the proportion of each diagnosis that you found. Okay, so uh, again, the interesting part for us in this is really kind of understanding you know, what data we use, what model we use. So I'm just going to get a bit more into this. Um, so I've just divided this in data collection, data pre processing, and also training. So in terms of data collection, uh, what we, we add when uh, at the moment uh, where I made this, this talk and also the results I'm going to show today, we add about 1,200 whole slide images uh, and it's divided over 10 sarcoma types. Uh, and we use about 654 for training and validation for reasons I'm not going to get into. And you might think that 654 examples are not much, but the thing is that digital pathology images, they're really huge images of gigabytes of size and there, there's millions of pixels. So what you end up doing is you kind of segment them into smaller images that are going to be able, that are going to be used in the, the AI network. So you end up with a lot of what we call tiles. So overall that does, uh, we used about 500 of those smaller tiles per whole site image so that gives a bit more than 300,000 images. So it's enough to do training if you use, for example, a transfer learning approach as we did. Um, just wanted to say a word that uh, at the moment we're training on more than 2,500 uh, whole slide images on 15 sarcoma types. So we're just ex expecting hopefully uh, those results to get better. Uh, one thing that you realize when you start doing AI with such large data sets is that at some point we're like, okay, we have each image that takes a few gigabytes of data. You need to have storage for at least four terabytes at the moment. Uh, and we need a solution to, to really store everything and also to not just to store everything, but to work with pathologists to be able to review cases efficiently and, and really work with them. So we we tried to find a solution where we could we, we could have like this this uh, this hosting solution and also this nice platform for visualization and everything. So we're using a nice tool that's called Omero. It's really an open source platform that you can access in a web browser, provided that you you have a server in your institution and you install the, the code for it. And yeah, as I said, you can store whole slide images on your server, and then you can uh, you can also store relevant clinical information. It has a really nice data model, uh, and then it's easy to collaborate with pathologists uh, just for visualization, to review cases, and even to do annotation. So when they when you look at slides with them, and they're like, okay, this thing I don't want, I, I think it's tumor, or this is not useful, you kind of you can annotate them and come back to it, and you can incorporate this into your training. So, the, so it's a really nice platform for that, and also it. It really interfaces well with the Python codes that we're using. So basically the, the framework basic, uh, just calls Amaro routines to download the data and upload results. So you could do training from anywhere in the world by just connecting to this remote server. So it's a really nice option. Uh, okay, so that's kind of, that's kind of it for, um, for data collection and just storage and everything. It was just to show that this is when you, you start doing AI, it's, this is most of the work you're going to spend doing. It's really developing something to store your data and access it easily. The training part is the kind of the easiest part at the end, um, at least for some types of problem. Um, now I'm going to talk about pre-processing. So that's basically just making sure your data is in a nice format that you can put into a network. Um, yeah, so basically digital pathology whole slide images, they're way too large for deep learning. As I said, it's it's images with millions of pixels, so you need to partition them. So we're, we're doing what we call tessellation, which is dividing the whole slide images into smaller images or tiles of 256 by 256 pixels. And what's going to happen at the end is that each whole slide image is going to be represented as a collection of those tiles. Um, 
of course, not all of those styles are relevant to make a diagnosis. Um, sometimes in the slides, you have muscle tissue, you have fatty tissues, you have tissues that are not relevant to the diagnosis. So uh, one thing that you need to do is identify the tiles that are helpful to make a diagnosis. So I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, we have a second step that's called color normalization because you, you might think that because it's microscopy images, uh, image color and quality can depend on the scanner that you're using. It also depends on who does the staining because this is a H&E staining on the slide. So this depends on the protocol that's used in the hospital and everything. So you really need to kind of uniformize the, the color content of the images. So we're, we're using a literature method to do that. I just wanted to raise up the, the fact that you need to kind of correct for this because it, of course it's quantitative information because it's, it, it's in the RGB space, but there's some external factors that, that has an impact uh, on that. Uh, the third thing is really, uh, is what we call tumor tile identification. So not all regions of a whole slide image are relevant for the task. So we need to identify where in the, the slide uh, is the tumor tissue. So we're, we're basically developed another deep learning algorithm that's gonna classify each tile as a specific tissue type. Uh, so we have seven different tissue types. As you can see, we have background, fat, muscle, stroma, which is essentially healthy tissue. We have vessels and we also have, uh, we detect some sort of artifacts that you can have in the images. Uh, yeah, so the, the end point of it is gonna be to identify a subset of the entire set of tiles that are most likely to be tumor tissue. So just in the so here, this was just to explain how we did this, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this just to let you know that at the moment, the specificity that we have on tumor tile identification is about 91%, which is, which is quite good enough for what we do. Okay. In terms of training, so this is the kind of slide that if you've been to conferences and people have presented about AI, you always have this kind of slide that's just people showing the kind of architecture you're using and everything. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say about it is that we're using a dense net 121 that was pre-trained on ImageNet. So it's really a transfer learning application. So uh, we found out that if, if this network is not pre-trained for this task, it's really not working as well. All right, so moving on to the result. So what I'm showing here in this figure on the left is essentially we have 10 bars because we have 10 sarcoma types. Uh, their names are given at the bottom here, but it's not really important. Uh, and then the, the y-axis, you have the tumor tile accuracy. So the way you would read this is if you look, for example, at the purple bar, which is a myxoma uh, type of sarcoma, you have about 90%, 94% uh, of your tiles that are correctly estimated by the AI network. So this is on an on a external test set. Um, and if you do the average over all the sarcoma types that we had, you end up with 75% of tile-wise accuracy, which is not too bad. Uh, however, the real quantity of interest is not the tile-wise accuracy. So if you remember, those are just small patches. It's the predicted tumor type for an entire whole site image. So the question is basically, how do you go from this tile-wise accuracy to a whole site image accuracy? And if you look at one example here, you can see that this is a, uh, type that's called a desmoid fibromatosis. Uh, this one has 90% of its styles correctly classified as this type. So if you just define, if you just say, well, in an image, I'm going to assume that the predicted whole slide image tumor type is going to be the most common type amongst all tiles. Then here you would identify the slide as a, as a desmoid fibromatosis and it would be correctly estimated. So if you do that for all of the examples that we had, you find out that essentially the whole slide diagnostic accuracy on average is 85%. So uh, we tested on 100 different slides in an external data set. So that means 85 of them were correctly classified, which is quite nice for the amount of data that we have. Um, of course, it means that 15 of them we didn't get the correct diagnosis. And if we look, for example, at one of them that was uh, misdiagnosed, uh, here you see that it's, again, this desmoid fibromatosis, but uh, it was identified as a different one with a slightly higher percentage. But it's, you still see that it, it kind of finds out a bit the, the correct diagnosis. So an option that, that we're also considering is to just say, well, instead of just reporting the top uh, prediction, you can report the top three predictions and then tell the pathologist, what if you order tests for those top three predictions? It's, mo it's more likely that you're going to have the answer in those three predictions. So when you do that, you can basically find out that 
the correct diagnosis is always found within 97, uh, in 97% of the whole site images, the correct diagnosis is found um, uh, in the top three predictions. So it's kind of, again, showing that the, you don't need to use just the top prediction. You can still give the top three predictions and it's probably going to help in reducing the, the time that it takes to make a diagnosis. All right, so I'm, I'm almost done. I just wanted to show just a, a few slides showing some results here. It's a, it's a nice one, a superficial fibromatosis with a very high Taiwan's accuracy. So, you know, if the pathologist sees this, it should be very confident and definitely order a test for superficial fibromatosis. Uh, same story here with the synovial sarcoma. And one thing that's nice with this, this kind of performance is that you can reach it even without using any kind of clinical features because the pathologists, they tell us that they're going to look at where the tumor is in the tissue. They're going to look at the size of the tumor, a bunch of other clinical features that are going to be helpful to make a diagnosis. And we're still reaching this kind of accuracy just by looking at the, the images themselves without any kind of clinical context. Uh, this is, again, another example uh, of a, a different sarcoma type. And I'm just going to finish on a bad note showing you one of the worst ones with only 8% accuracy. And here you see that most sarcomas ended up having between 5 and 30% of, of uh, prediction. And I guess that if a pathologist would see this kind of rainbow-looking image, they would say, okay, this is not working out. I'm not going to use it. And hopefully this is where like the OMERO platform comes in and we can kind of flag this example and we can start to do active learning and work with them more closely, try to understand what went wrong here. All right, so that's kind of the conclusion for what I had to say today. So thing to remember is just that what we've done up to now, we've had 85% classification accuracy on 10 different sarcoma types. So it's really a promising step uh, towards a clinical implementation. Um, what we're gonna do is expand this to more, more data and more sarcoma types. Uh, also, we're gonna compare the accuracy of this AI framework against pathologists. Uh, and to do that, we're, we're developing, as you can see on the right, it's kind of a web app that pathologists are gonna be able to connect to and just test themselves on the, uh, on the examples that we're using AI with. Uh, also, it's going to be to include other clinical features to make the model more robust. All right. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take any kind of question that you might have. Thank you.